So we're going to start out. I'm going to I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Grima Gupta from uh, University of Alabama in Birmingham. Um, uh, she is a medical oncologist and uh, um, uh, sees patients with GI malignancies and and neuroendocrine tumors and developing a neuroendocrine tumor program. Uh, in at UAB, uh, she uh, I've known her for several years. She she trained with uh, with a, a, a few familiar names that you may have heard of, Dr. Bull Anthony and Dr. Aman Chahan, uh, at University of Kentucky, and then uh, decided to. Uh, branch out south and uh, and start a, a, a net program or, or, or develop one. So um, so she's going to talk. Uh, uh, she's going to give us a, a a big overview of neuroendocrine tumors and how we diagnose these and some of the treatments. And then later on today we'll get into some more of the specifics with uh, surgeries, PRRT. I'll talk about some lung neuroendocrine tumors later. On. And then we're going to look behind the scenes at a multidisciplinary program. So. Um, so with that, um, uh, let's introduce, uh, let's bring to the stage Dr. Uh, Gupta. So good morning. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. Um, thank you, Dr. Ramirez, Bob, and Marianne for inviting me. Um, I, as uh, Dr. Ramirez was saying, uh, I moved uh, from University of Kentucky to University of Alabama just last year. Um, and so this is my first time uh, at an NCAN event. I'm very excited uh, to meet you all, to connect with everybody, um, and to hopefully give you a good talk this morning. All right. So um, this, we can go to the next slide. I have no... Um, disclosures for the for this talk. So today we are going to be, uh, uh, next slide please, we're going to be talking first about what neuroendocrine tumors are, how common they are, we're going to talk about the gradient differentiation of neuroendocrine tumors, the stage of neuro how neuroendocrine tumors are staged, the different symptoms that can happen with neuroendocrine tumors, then we're going to move on to how neuroendocrine tumors are diagnosed, the common labs uh, that we use in clinical practice, uh, and imaging, as well as what somatostatin receptors are. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about how neuroendocrine tumors um, are treated, the importance of multidisciplinary care, and the treatment options. Next slide, please. So what are neuroendocrine tumors? Neuroendocrine tumors are a spectrum of cancers that can originate in neuroendocrine cells and can affect almost any part of the body. Um, the most common are gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So these are neuroendocrine tumors that arise along the GI tract. So it could be the esophagus, the stomach, the small bowel, large bowel, pancreas, uh, the appendix, anywhere basically along the GI tract. Um, um, they can also arise in the lung, but really they can arise anywhere in the body. Um, any site is possible. Most recently I saw a patient um, whose neuroendocrine tumor started in the nose. Um, and that was the first time I was seeing that in my uh, practice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of how common neuroendocrine tumors are, so the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors, um, as you may already know about this, has been rising. Um, it has, it rose sevenfold between 1970s to 2012. Um, and because with Patients with grade 1 and grade 2 neuroendocrine tumors can have a long survival. There is also a high prevalence of neuroendocrine tumors. In the United States, we have an estimated of more than 170,000 patients with neuroendocrine tumors. The average, the median age is about 60 years, uh, but it can happen at a younger age. Um, I have several patients in their 20s, 30s, um, and then specifically if uh, when these neuroendocrine tumors, specifically the pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors and pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, they can be associated with genetic syndromes and can happen at a younger age. Next slide, please. So NETs are an extremely heterogeneous group of cancers. Um, what I mean by that is symptoms, disease course, treatment can vary widely amongst patients. You can have somebody with a stage 4 grade 1 neuroendocrine tumor um, who has just been on observation uh, without requiring any treatment. And then you can have somebody uh, with grade 3 neuroendocrine tumor uh, who, you know, when you get diagnosed, you, you have a lot of disease when you get diagnosed and you need treatment right away. Um, so you may have symptoms, you may not have symptoms, you may need treatment right away, you may not need treatment right away. So these things can really, really vary amongst neuroendocrine tumors. Next slide, please. So let's talk about tumor grade and differentiation. 
when you are diagnosed um, and you are diagnosed either through a biopsy or after a surgery, that tissue that is obtained is sent to the lab and is analyzed um, by a pathologist. Um, that pathologist is looking at a neuromicroscope microscope um, and telling us two big things. The first thing they're telling us is the grade of the tumor. So the grade of the tumor refers to the biological aggressivity of the cancer. And the way they determine that is by using a tissue stain, called KI-67. Um, and the second thing they look at is the number of dividing cells, which is known as the mitotic count. The grade of the tumor is divided into three different types. There is grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. Grade 1 is the slowest growing, and grade 3 is the fastest growing. The second thing we look at Oh, okay. The second thing we look at is the differentiation of the neuroendocrine tumor. So that refers to the extent to which the cancer cells resemble their non-cancerous counterparts. So if we are dealing with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, we're looking at the normal pancreas and how much it resembles the normal pancreas. And this, uh, the classification for this is well-differentiated, and the way I like to think of that is they're well-behaved, typically well-behaved. And then when they're poorly differentiated, they're poorly behaved neuroendocrine um, neoplasms. So this brings me to another point, uh, because now I've written down neuroendocrine carcinoma. So what is the difference between neuroendocrine neoplasm, neuroendocrine tumor, and neuroendocrine carcinoma, because you may be seeing these terms or hearing these terms. So let's go to the next slide. So just think of, okay, thank you. So just think of neuroendocrine neoplasms as an umbrella term, um, and neuroendocrine neoplasms consist of neuroendocrine tumor and neuroendocrine carcinomas. Neuroendocrine tumors can, are the grade one, grade two, grade three, um, and the neuroendocrine carcinomas are the, usually the poorly differentiated types of cancers. So this is just an analogy to kind of understand uh, what the different grades are. So think of grade one as a horse cart. Um, it's just, you know, slow growing, slow moving. In the middle, you have um, an Honda, a handle cart, which is, you know, not as fast as a Corvette on the right, but also not as slow as a horse cart. Um, so these are the three different types of uh, grades that we have. And then as I was saying before, poorly differentiated cancers are more aggressive, a higher grade tumor is going to be more aggressive than a lower grade tumor. But one key thing to understand is that not all high grade nets are going to be poorly differentiated, but all poorly differentiated cancers are going to be high grade. Okay. So this is the, the classification um, that we use uh, for uh, neuroendocrine tumors and carcinomas. Uh, to just keep it simple, if you look on the first on the left, the lung carcinoids, they are divided into typical and atypical based on the mitotic count and the level of the level of death that we can see within the tissue. And then we have the gastroenteropancreatic nets or the, uh, the gap nets. As I said earlier, there is grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3, and that is based on the mitotic count and the KI-67. And then on the rightmost, you have the neuroendocrine carcinoma. So there is a small cell type and a large cell type. Um, and as you can see, the mitotic count and the KI-67 is going to be uh, more than 20% for those. And they are the poorly differentiated type. So now we know what grade and differentiation means. The next thing we need to look at is the stage. So after after you've had surgery or a biopsy, that tissue gets analyzed by the pathologist. The next thing we're going to look at is uh, if the cancer has spread um, and understanding the extent of spread. Um, the stage of the cancer describes how much cancer is in the body. This can be determined uh, based on imaging or after you have had surgery. There's each different type of neuroendocrine tumor has its own staging system, so we're not going to go into each type. But a higher stage means more advanced, sta uh, advanced disease. And a stage 4, in general, means that the cancer has spread to a distant organ from where it started. For example, if you have pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and it's spread to the liver, it means a stage 4 pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. But when I meet people in clinic, I make it a point to explain that a stage 4 neuroendocrine tumor, for example, a grade 1 neuroendocrine tumor, is not the same as a stage 4 of another cancer. The word stage 4 can sometimes be very scary, but 
A pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, grade one, is nothing like a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which is the typical aggressive type of cancer that we see. Terms of symptoms of neuroendocrine tumors. So there is a subset of patients who may not have any symptoms at all, um, and that's okay. I mean that that is uh, that can happen if your tumor is not compressing on any organs or any structures, um, is not compressing on any nerves. You may not have any symptoms. If the tumor is not um, producing any hormones, you may not have any symptoms related to that. So what are the symptoms that can be present? There can be mass effect from the tumor. Um, so if you have a mesenteric mass, like a mass in your abdomen, for example, that can cause abdominal pain. It can cause nausea or vomiting if it's causing obstruction. If it's compressing on the bile ducts, it can cause jaundice. If you have a mass in the lung compressing on your windpipe, that can cause cough or shortness of breath. If you have tumors in the bones, that can cause pain. And then um, in terms of the functional versus non-functional tumors, um, so. Uh, neuroendocrine tumors can secrete hormones and peptides, um, um, specifically serotonin, which can cause carcinoid syndrome. Um, and this is most commonly associated with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Um, there are also other hormones that can be secreted, including glucagon, gastrin, insulin, VIP. Um, these are most commonly seen with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And then a minority of lung neuroendocrine tumors can also present, uh, also produce hormones. So spending a second on carcinoid syndrome, like I was saying, almost always seen with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, symptoms include flushing and watery diarrhea. Um, triggers of uh, carcinoid syndrome can be stress, either physical or emotional, high amine foods, um, or you may have symptoms even without these triggers. Uh, over time, uh, these hormones, uh, the serotonin, can cause damage to the heart most commonly on the right side of the heart in the valves. Um, and this is known as carcinoid heart disease, but this is very uncommon. It's something to be aware of, but this happens uncommonly. In terms of the tumor markers, um, the first thing I want to say about these tumor markers, they are not sufficient for diagnosis. These are things that we use in clinic um, to uh, aid in diagnosis, but these alone are not sufficient for diagnosis. The, the common tests that are used are chromogranin A, serotonin, uh, plasma, or urine 5 HIAA, uh, the pancreatostatin, neurokinin, and there's, there's others as well. And this can vary, these practices can vary amongst physicians. You know, you may go to one physician who likes to order all of these tests, and then another person may use just two of the tests. Um, so uh, this, this can really vary, and uh, the reason we don't use these alone for diagnosis, for example, with chromogranin A, um, you know, if you have a mildly elevated chromogranin A, that can be from medications that you're taking for reflux. If you don't have any evidence on imaging or scopes or anything of neuroendocrine tumor, th this test alone is not going to be sufficient to diagnose you. Okay. Um, and then the other test, gastrin, VIP, the other hormones that we were um, uh, talking about, we don't routinely check them unless we are concerned about the tumor producing those hormones, which will be evident by us talking to you and telling, you know, you telling us your symptoms. Okay, let's talk about imaging. So we've talked about labs. <clears throat> the second thing we're going to talk about is imaging. So this is performed at diagnosis uh, for staging, and then whether you are undergoing treatment or just undergoing uh, surveillance without any treatment right now, just disease monitoring, you're going to be monitored with imaging. So there's anatomical imaging, which is the CAT scans and the MRIs. Um, the CAT scans are really what most of us use in clinical practice, and then the MRIs are more useful when we're looking at the liver. Um, and then in terms of the PET scans, these are called function, these fall under functional imaging and are combined with a non-contrast CAT scan or an MRI. So this, this becomes confusing uh, when you're in clinic and you, you hear that you're going to have a PET CT. What does that mean or a PET MRI? Well, it's, you're, when you're doing a regular CT or MRI, you're getting a dye specific for that type of test. But when you're doing a PET CT or a PET MRI, you're getting a radioactive dye, which is going to help us with the PET part of it. Okay, um, so the first um, 
type of PET scan is the uh, FDG PET scan, which is, think of it as a radioactive glucose or radioactive sugar, um, and we use that uh, sometimes for higher grade disease. Um, and the reason we use it for higher grade disease is because um, those tumors are faster growing um, and need glucose. Um, so they're going to take up this radioactive glucose, and we are going to be able to see which areas in your body are taking up that uh, radioactive glucose. Um, and the other type of pets that we use are the SSTR pets, which are the two dyes that we use for that um, are the gallium 68 or the copper 64 uh, dotatate pets. So in order to understand how these PET scans work, um, it's very important to understand what a somatostatin receptor is. And I'm going to try to keep this simple. So the somatostatin receptor is a key player in neuroendocrine tumors. It is present on the cell surface of a neuroendocrine tumor cell. So just imagine I'm a neuroendocrine tumor cell, and I'm wearing a red hat. Um, so that red hat is the somatostatin receptor, OK? And when you get this radioactive dye, it's going to try to find these cells with the red hat and stick to it and light up on the PET scan, OK? So for the scan, this you get this radioactive dye. Um, and after the tracer is injected, you wait for a, a, a period of time. Um, and after that, we take pictures in combination with either a CT or a MRI. Um, and then we are able to figure out where the tumors have spread and monitor the uh, if the tumors are spreading or continuing to stay stable. Let's uh, talk about uh, treatment. So. I'm not going to be able to cover, of course, everything um, in the time that I have in terms of treatment. So I'm going to just focus on some key concepts here when it comes to treatment. So multidisciplinary treatment, I cannot em emphasize enough how important and a patient-centered approach, how important that is when we're talking about treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. Okay, The factors that we consider when we meet you in clinic and kind of talk about treatment options, we look at the symptoms, um, if you're having any symptoms at all, or if this was just found when you were having um, a scan for kidney stones. Uh, what the grade of the tumor is after you've had a biopsy, how much uh, tumor do you actually have in your body right now, um, and if you've had a prior scan, for example, are the tumors growing or are they staying the same size? Um, are they spreading anywhere outside of where they started? So those are all things that we consider when we're making uh, treatment decisions. The other thing uh, that's important is, uh, can we do surgery for the tumor? If you are symptomatic, can we remove the tumor that's causing the symptoms? Um, and even if you're not having symptoms, but you have widespread disease, are we able to remove about 70% of your disease burden to give you a longer survival? Okay, So those are things that you can talk to your oncologist about. Um, you'll most likely be meeting a surgical oncologist uh, when you have a diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor, um, and they're going to determine if that's something that you're going to benefit from. Um, and then I wanted to take a minute to talk about what somatostatin analogs are. This is... Um, a lot of you may already be on this medication. This is a monthly injection that's given with octreotide or landriotide. So um, I want you to just remember me with the red hat again. The red hat is the somatostatin receptor. Um, so earlier we were talking about the radioactive dye. Now I want you to think of a drug that works on the same receptor, but it's sending signals into the cells, and it's helping control the growth rate, the spread, as well as helping the symptoms of the neuroendocrine tumor. And then the same concept applies when we are talking about PRRT, which we're going to hear more about later. Um, it works on the on these same receptors as well. I want to briefly also mention Zermelo. Um, so this is trilitrosat. This is a drug um, that can be used uh, for patients who have carcinoid syndrome. So the way this works is it uh, inhibits production of serotonin in the body. I have a picture of the mechanism here, but the big uh, big thing to remember is it's uh, inhibiting production of serotonin, um, and it can help control the symptoms that are associated with carcinoid syndrome, including diarrhea and flushing. So multidisciplinary approach, the treatment options we have, how do we sequence treatment? Do we need to start a SSA? I think these are all very important questions that we talk about when we meet you in clinic. Um, for example, if you have had um, 
a slow growing grade one neuroendocrine tumor of the small bowel with involvement in the liver, two, just two spots that have been stable for the last three years, you may not even need any treatment, okay? So that is something that is important to discuss with your oncologist. And then in terms of sequencing treatment, we have so many different options. We have different types of chemotherapy pills we can use. We have liver-directed therapy with embolization procedures that we may be hearing about later on. We have PRRT. Um, and the important thing to remember here is there's not one recipe for everyone, and there is no one way to sequence treatment. Everybody's disease is unique, um, and your oncologist will figure out your treatment plan based on your disease, OK? Um, the other thing we take in consideration are the comorbid conditions. So if you have diabetes, some, some drugs may not be the best for you. If you have high blood pressure, we may have to be more careful using some of these chemotherapy pills. And then even though we have all these options, um, there is, of course, still an ongoing need for novel treatment options. So clinical trial en enrollment is also very important. Some of the take-home messages, I'm at the end of my talk. Um, so I'm, I've written here NENS, which is the neuroendocrine neoplasm. So hopefully everyone here now knows the difference between neuroendocrine neoplasms. That's the umbrella term. They can arise anywhere uh, in your body, almost any part of the body. We talked about the heterogeneity of these types of cancers, how it can differ in terms of symptoms, the burden, um, the different grades, and the differentiation. So know your pathology. Do not think of these stage 4 nets as other types of cancers. These are a completely different beast. Um, and then, you know, like I was saying, most people have non-functional tumors, so not everybody is going to have carcinoid syndrome. Not everybody with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is going to have a glucagonoma or insulinoma or elevated levels of gastrin. So not all of these functional uh, syndromes apply to uh, all the patients. Um, and then the last thing, that treatment truly does require a multidisciplinary approach. So an oncologist, a surgical oncologist, nuclear medicine, interventional radiologist, radiation oncologist. Uh, it takes really a village uh, of people to provide good care for neuroendocrine tumors. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is my contact information.